Section 6.1 is on graphing quadratic functions. Okay, a quadratic function is a function that can be written in the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, so basically it has to have an x squared term. A quadratic parent function is the basic f of x equals x squared or y equals x squared. And y equals x squared, do you guys know what that looks like? y equals x squared? Yeah. Anybody know y equals x squared? No one does? <laughs> okay, I guess that's why we're doing this chapter. It looks like this. It's called a parabola. So it's a U shape. Mine's kind of pointy there, but it's a U shape, and it's called a parabola. Not parabola. <laughs> so a lot of you guys say it, parabola. All right, so number one, so graph f of x equals x squared plus 3 by using a table. Okay, so we're going to use our t table. Our y values are always going to be x squared plus 3. Okay, so if I plug in like 0, 1, 2, negative 1, and negative 2. So the first one I have 0 squared plus 3 would be 3. And the next one I'd have 1 squared plus 3. You don't have to write all the work if you can see it, but 4. 2 squared plus 3, so 2 squared would be 4, plus 3 would be 7. How about the next one? Yep, because it's negative 1 in parentheses squared, so it's 1 plus 3 is 4, and the last one is also 7. Okay, so I have 0, 3, 1, 4, 2, 7, So I don't think I went too Four, five, six. All right, and then I have negative one four and negative two seven. Okay, so it's very symmetric. So the heights on both sides are even. There we go. So we have that shape. Okay, you should kind of have a clue that it's going to be a U shape. It's going to be that parabola because you have the x squared. So that was your largest degree, was 2. Okay, so what if I had x minus 2 squared? Um, and I'm going to graph it using a table. Okay, on these ones where the, you have x minus 2 in parentheses, I always tell my students to think about what would make it as small as possible. So what would make that 0? Like what value of x? 2. I usually kind of put that in the middle of my t-table, and then I go down from there, so it's uh, 1 and 0, and up from there, so 3 and 4 would be good points to pick. You guys can do the other points, 0, 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2 that we did before, but your numbers might be really big. Um, so that's going to kind of center your curve. Yes, Kurt? Um, you can do some negative numbers, so let's say you want to do negative 1. So let's see what happens. So if I have a negative 1, I'm going to have negative 1 minus 2 squared. So I get negative 3 squared, which is 9. <coughs> the next one I have 0, so 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Squared is 4. The next one, 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Square it and you get 1. 2 minus 2 squared is 0. 3 minus 2 is 1. Square it, square it and you get 1. 4 minus 2 is 2. Square it and you get 4. So here's my point. So I have negative 1, 9. So that's what I meant by they might get a little big. Um, so negative 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's way up there. 0, 4. 1, 1. 2, 0. 3, 1. 4, 4. So do you see if you tried anything to the left of negative 1, if you tried negative 2, it would be really big. Negative 3 would be even bigger. Okay. So you get this shape. Okay. So in both of these examples, there's something that we call the axis of symmetry. Okay, so this is the line. It's like the fold line. If you folded it over, it would match up directly. Okay, so in this one, it was the y-axis. 
Okay, that's called the axis of symmetry, so it's like your fold line. It says it's called the line through the vertex of the parabola. All right, properties of parabola. It says for f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, the parabola has these properties. So the first one, the parabola opens upwards if a is greater than 0 and downwards if a is less than 0. Okay, so when I say a, a is the number in front of your x squared. Okay, the axis of symmetry is the vertical line x equals negative b over 2a. Sorry, there's like 10. <laughs> really think I'm going to have to. The vertex is the point negative b over 2a is your y value, or your x value. And how would you find the y value? So let's say that number had been 3. How would I find the y value that goes with something? Uh, you do what? Yeah, so let's say my axis of symmetry was x equals 3. So if I had x equals 3, how do I find the y value that goes with it? <laughs> no one knows. You just go back and you plug in, kind of like we did up here, right? If I knew x was equal to 2, the y value was 0. Okay, so you just plug into your original. So in order to do that, see our function was f of x. How we're going to write this is we're going to say f of negative b over 2a. So that's saying plug in that number into your function. So if it had been 3 for x, you would have f of 3 for your y value. And then the y-intercept, um, remember when we're finding intercepts, if I want to find the x-intercept, I plug in 0 for y. If I want to find the y-intercept, I plug in 0 for x. So looking at this function, what happens when I plug in 0 for x? What would you get out? C. So the y-intercept is just C. Okay, so let's try some different things. Okay, so the first example says, for each of the following problems, complete these steps. So determine whether it opens upwards or downward, uh, find the axis of symmetry, find the vertex, find the y-intercept, sketch the graph of the function. All right, so the first one. So I have f of x equals x squared plus 2x minus 1. <laughs> okay, so um, a, does this open upwards or downwards? Yeah, because a is 1, and that's positive. So it opens upwards. And you can just draw a little upwards, it's fine. Find the axis of symmetry. So I need x equals negative b over 2a. Okay, so in this problem, the number in front of my x squared is my a. So a is 1. The number in front of my um, x is b, so b is 2. The number in front of my or the number by itself with no x's is my c. So I just have negative 1 at the end. Do you guys see where I'm getting those numbers? So I have 1, 2, negative 1. Those are those numbers. If you guys remember the quadratic um, formula from algebra 1, do you guys remember that? That's what we're doing. We're using a, b, and c from the quadratic formula. Okay, so I get negative b, so negative 2 over 2 times 1. So I have negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1. Okay, so that's the axis of symmetry. So at negative 1, you can draw a dotted line. All right, C, find the vertex. So we know that the vertex is along that line. So its x value is negative 1. You need to find a y value. So I need to find f of negative 1. So go back in your original. And whenever you have negatives, make sure you put parentheses around it. So negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 minus 1. So I get 1 minus 2 minus 1. So you get negative 2. Okay, that means your vertex, you had negative 1 for your x value, and you got negative 2 for your y value. So go down to that point and draw, or that place and draw a point. Okay, right there. All right, now that's that's almost all the information we need to sketch it because we know it goes upwards. So you could kind of just, I mean, don't do this, but you could like sketch a parabola here like that, and that would be a rough sketch of your parabola. But do I know that it's that skinny? 
I don't really know how wide it is. You know, it could have been real, real skinny or real, real wide. So we don't know which one it is. Okay, so that's why it's always good to find another point. And the easiest point to find is the uh, y-intercept. So if I'm finding the y-intercept, I'm going to plug in 0 for x. So when we do that, it's always that last number. So the number that was all by itself without an x. So it's negative 1. So I get 0, comma, negative 1. Okay, that's telling you how wide it is. Because of the axis of symmetry, once I have that point 0, 1, think about folding it over. What would be another point that you would automatically have? Negative 2, negative 1, right? This one right here. Okay. And then you can draw on your parabola. So it looks about like that. Okay, if you weren't sure um, if it was a little bit wider than that or anything, you could always do another point. Okay, 2. So I have negative 2x squared plus 8x plus 5. Okay, upwards or downwards? <coughs> downwards, because a is negative 2, so it's negative. So it's going to go downwards. Okay, b, I need to find the axis of symmetry. So I have x equals negative b over 2a. So whenever it says negative b, that means the opposite of whatever your b is. So if my b value had been negative 8, negative b would be positive 8, right? So just because it's negative doesn't mean it's always negative. All right, so I have negative um, b is 8 all over 2 times negative 2. So do you guys need me to write down what a, b, and c are? Do you guys all know that? Okay, so a is negative 2. B is 8, C is 5. So it's just the numbers in your equation. Oops. All right, so I have negative 8 over negative 4, so I get 2. So find the vertex. That's your x value. We know that since that's your axis of symmetry at 2, your vertex is along that axis of symmetry. So the vertex starts out with 2 comma something. So we need to find the y value that goes with it. So I'm going to find f of 2. So I have negative 2 times 2 squared plus 8 times 2 plus 5. So notice I just put my 2 in parentheses. That's going to kind of help you as you're computing. So now you know that 2 is being squared first, and then it's being multiplied by negative 2. So 2 squared is 4 times negative 2 is negative 8 plus 16 plus 5. So you get 13. Um, because I know that my uh, vertex is along that axis, so the vertex has to have the x value of 2. So basically, I'm saying if I had 2 on my t-table, what's the y value that goes with it? So I'm just plugging into the original. So that's a way of notating that, that you're plugging into into your original function. You what? It what? It doesn't fit on there? I know, man. I'm terrible. All right, so we're going to have to go up higher than the graph. So how many do we have in the graph? 10? Okay, so it's up there. Or you could go by twos. You could make them all work two. All right, and then D, find the y-intercept. So what's my y-intercept going to be? Zero comma five, right? You plug in zero to get five out. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay, automatically, if you have that point, you also have to have the point on the opposite side of the axis. So if I have zero, five, I also have to have four, five. Because I was two away from the axis, so I need to go two away on the other side. Oops, I missed this, the point. Not very good. So it looks something like that. Opens downwards, goes through all those points. <coughs> Make sense? Okay. So let's go back, and we're going to talk about domain and range. So we've talked about domain and range before, um, but very, very briefly. Okay, so the domain of a function is a set of all input values on the graph 
and the range is, is the set of all the um, output values. So in other words, domain is all the x's, and range is all of the y's. Okay, and that's really important. So let's go back and look at these two examples and think about the domain and range. Okay, see how this graph goes on, on forever to the left and the right? It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, is there any x value that will not be graphed? So at x equals 50, is there a point that goes with that? Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, so no matter, like in your original, you can plug in anything you want for x. You can make a t-table and you can put 550 million on the t-table. It doesn't matter, there'd be a y value that goes with it. Okay, there's nothing that's undefined. So there's no denominator equal to zero, and there's no like negatives under square roots or anything. Those are the things that are gonna affect domain. So negatives under roots and uh, zeros and denominators. Okay, so on all of these problems, all of our parabola problems, your domain is gonna be negative infinity to infinity. And you never have anything that's bad, you know, undefined. All right, so at negative infinity to infinity is our domain. Remember when I first taught you this, I said domain, if you move from the left to the right and you take your pencil and you're moving your pencil across from left to right, are you always hitting a point? Yeah, there's always a point that's matching up with each of these lines, right? Okay, so that means that your domain is negative infinity to infinity. Okay, your range, the range is all of the y values on your graph. So I always say move your pencil from the bottom to the top. So as I'm moving my pencil up, what's the first y value I hit? Negative what? Yep, negative 2. And then do I hit every y value after that? Yeah, it goes on forever. So it's negative 2 to infinity. And we want to indicate that we actually hit negative 2. So it's a filled in circle, so we do a bracket. Okay, so for the next one, like I told you, negative infinity to infinity is going to be your domain for all of these parabolas. Your range. So as you're moving from the bottom, are you hitting y values? Yeah. What's the last y value you hit? 13. So it's negative infinity to 13. Bracket. Okay, so that's how you would do domain and range for these. Okay, an interesting question. Am I ever going to have a parabola on its side? That's going to be a function. So would it be a function? <laughs> you guys know this answer. I'm just being shy. Taylor, would it be a function? No, why? Yeah, the line thing, the vertical line test. Do you guys remember that? So it wouldn't be a function. So all these that we're doing are quadratic functions. I think that might have been, yeah, graphing quadratic functions. So our functions are always going to be y equals x squared something. Okay, what would the equation of one that's on its side be? So it wouldn't be y equals x squared. It would be what? x equals y squared, right? Okay, so number one, so find the minimum or maximum value of f of x equals x squared plus 4x plus 4. So it's saying how high or how low does it go? What's the highest point or lowest point? So sketch a graph of the function and state the domain and range of the function. So first of all, is this going to be a minimum or is it, is it going to have a maximum? So think about the shape of the parabola. Does it open upwards or downwards? Upwards. So if it's going to open upwards, will there be a maximum or a minimum? Minimum. So let's go ahead and sketch a graph of the function. So we're going to go through those different steps. So first I know it opens upward. I need to find x equals negative b over 2a. So in our case, a is 1, b is 4, c is 4. So I have negative 4 over 2 times 1. So negative 4 over 2 is negative 2. <coughs> That's your axis of symmetry. 
once you have that axis of symmetry, you need to figure out where your vertex is along that axis of symmetry. So you need to find the y value that goes with it. So we're going to find f of negative 2, which is the y value. When I plug it into my function, I'm going to plug negative 2 in parentheses. So I have negative 2 squared plus 4 times negative 2 plus 4. So I get 4 minus 8 plus 4. So I get 0. So I have negative 2, 0. So it's right there on the axis. Let's find the y-intercept. Your y-intercept, if you plug in 0 for x, what do you get for y? 4. So you go to your original. It's the, the number without the x. Okay, and once you have that point, you can always find the other point. Another point. So I was 2 away from the axis. See how I'd go 1, 2, over. So I have to go 2 over here to get another point. So at negative 4, 4, I also have a point. So here's what my parabola looks like. Okay, so it says find the minimum or maximum value. There's no maximum because it goes on forever. It gets higher and higher and higher, right? So no maximum. And then we say the minimum of the y value, so minimum of 0, and we say it's at x equals negative 2. Okay, so that's how we write it in calculus, so you guys can kind of get used to writing it that way. So the first one's the y value, and then this is obviously at the x value. And we write it that way because we want to know how high or low something goes, so that's telling you that the lowest it goes is that y value, 0. Okay, and then our last two are the domain and range. So domain is negative infinity to infinity. You can plug whatever you want for x. You're never going to get undefined. And your range, what's the first y value you hit? Zero. So it's bracket zero to infinity. That's your domain and range. Next one. So a souvenir shop sells about 200 coffee mugs each month for $6 each. The shop owner estimates that for each 50 cent increase in price, he'll sell about 10 fewer coffee mugs per month. How much should the owner charge for each mug in order to maximize the monthly income for their sales? Okay, so I'm giving you a little hint here. So I said the monthly income equals the number of coffee mugs sold uh, multiplied by the price at which they're sold. Right, that's the amount of money that the shop owner is bringing in. Okay, so if you sell 200 coffee mugs for six dollars each, the monthly income would be twelve hundred dollars, right? So twelve or two hundred times six. Okay, but we are going to lower the price. We don't know how much we're lowering it by. So let's let x equal. Um, so how much should the owner charge? The number of 50 cent price increases. Okay, this will make sense in a second. Okay, so if he has one price increase, so he increases it from $6 to $6.50. So let's kind of write a little chart over here. At $6, he sells 200 mugs, right? At $6.50, he sells 10 fewer mugs. So he'd sell 190 mugs. At $7, he would sell 180 mugs. See the pattern? $7.50, he'd sell 170. Okay, so we need to somehow relate these. So my income is going to be the number of coffee mugs sold. So you started with 200, and for each price increase, you lost 10. So how would I represent that with x? No, no 0.5 yet. 
So we started with 200, and we're going to have less than 200. We're going to subtract out a certain amount. It's not x. I'm not doing 200 minus x because that's just the number of price increases. But for each price increase, I lost 10. So what do I write there? What? 10 plus x, right? So if you only had one price increase, you are now at 190. If you had two, you're now at 180. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the number of coffee mugs sold. And then the price at which they're sold. So now this is involving the 0.5. <coughs> so the price at which they're sold, they started at $6. And you add on 50 cents for each increase. So now what? Yep, 0.50x, good. Does that make sense? It's a tough one. All right, let's FOIL. So I get 1,200. So first, outer is plus 100x. Inner is minus 60x. Last is minus 5x squared. So I get negative 5x squared plus 40x plus 1,200. 1,200 kind of ran into my plus sign, so plus 1,200. That's your income. Okay, we want to maximize this. So this is a certain parabola, right? Because it's x squared. Does it go upwards or downwards? It goes downwards. So that means that there is going to be a maximum for this. Okay, so we have, it's like that. So there's going to be a max. So think about how to find the max. That we just do negative b over 2a to find the axis and then plug it in to find the y value that goes with it. So I have x equals negative b over 2a. So I get negative 40 over 2 times negative 5. So I get 4. Okay, that means that the owner should make four price increases. So how many dollars are they going up by? Two. Two dollars, right? So you could look at our little chart over here, and you could find that it would be $8, and he, he or she, I guess, would be selling 160 mugs, right? Okay, so $8. So that was four fifty cent increases. All right, and then B, what is the maximum monthly income the owner can expect to make from these items? So that's the number of increases, so four price increases. Um, so you go back and you plug in to the income equation. You plug in four. So I have negative five times four squared plus 40 times four plus 1,200. So I get negative 5 times 16 plus 160 plus 1,200. That's negative 80. That's a times. Plus 160 plus 1,200. So 80 minus 160 is 80. So plus 1,200. So what's the maximum income? Yeah, 1,280. Could you let? Yes, you could also do 8 times 160. It's not bad for selling coffee mugs. I'd make $1,200 a month selling coffee mugs. It's fine. <laughs> Gabby's found her future job. <laughs> All right. An object uh, tossed upward with an initial velocity of 15 feet per second from a height of 4 feet has the equation h of t equals negative 16t squared plus 15t plus 4. All right. These are... Um, these quadratic functions are very important in what's called projectile motion. So if we're throwing something, something in the air, like a ball, it goes up, it comes down. It makes a parabola shape. It's also important if you're, like, firing, I don't know, firing a gun into the air. It comes up, it comes down. You want to know where it's going to land, right? So it's very important to know um, what happens when you toss something in the air. Okay, so let's see. So what is the object's maximum height? So here's my equation. 
I need to find the maximum height. So this time I have t instead of x. So let's write t equals negative b over 2a. So I have negative 15 over 2 times negative 16. So I get negative 15 over negative 32. So we're just going to leave it as 15 over 32. Okay, what do you think that represents in our problem? Yeah, but what is x? In this case, t. What do you think t stands for? Time. Okay, so 15 over 32. Somebody find that on their calculator, um, what a decimal approximation is. Point four six, we'll say point four six nine. That's the number of seconds it takes to reach its maximum height. Okay, then it says what is the object's maximum height? So in your original equation, h of t, that's your height. It's saying your height after t seconds. So we want to find h of 0.469 seconds. So Kern, go ahead and keep that number in your calculator. And when you put this in, I want you to do answer. So use your answer key. Do you guys all know how to use answer? So you're going to have negative 16 times, and then hit second, enter. I think that pulls up answer. negative pulls up the answer, so you thought it says answer above it, squared plus 15 times answer plus 4. So you're going to make sure you're not rounding throughout your problem, you're keeping that last answer. What do you guys get? Okay, round to three decimal places. 7.516. Okay, now what does this represent? The height, and it's in what units? Feet. So that's how many feet it would go up to. So it started four feet up, you threw it up <coughs> to 7.516 feet, and then it fell back down. Okay, so those are your two answers. Is that the last one? Yep. 